during the, um, well, just recently I've been sort of struck again uh, by Psalm 1, uh, which is a, um, an interesting opening psalm to the whole book of Psalms that uh, gives to us, we might say in a nutshell, what it is that uh, the Lord is really intending that we do in this world as his children. Why it is he's doing this work that he is doing, certainly it's, his reasons are multifaceted. But one of the primary things he intends to do in us is to make us obedient Christians. And so what we see here is the blessing that uh, he begins the Psalms with, the blessing pronounced upon the one who would actually walk according to the will of God. Let me read Psalm 1 as we begin. The psalmist writes, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Uh, May the Lord bless his word. Again, I'll just remind you that this psalm includes, I think, everything that we would hope to obtain in this world for the glory of God, for our own good, and it reminds us of what's going to happen to those in the world who live contrary to the will of God. Basically, that includes everybody in the world who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we want to understand is what is God's will for us? What does He want us to be like? What does He want us to do? How does He want us to live? What does it mean to live openly as a Christian? Understanding that our Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the law of God perfectly. He did basically what Psalm 1 says. And the fact that we are to follow him means that this is what we are to do if we are to live openly as Christians or as Christ. Now again this morning, as I've already mentioned, we were exhorted to do exactly that. To walk as Jesus walked. To live as he lived. We saw that uh, when he went up to the feast, that there was a mixed group at Jerusalem and they were waiting for Jesus really to show up at the feast. Uh, Within that group there were some who thought he was a good man, some who thought that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, while there were others who thought he was a deceiver, that he was leading the people astray. Now the second group who thought he was a deceiver were very outspoken about their beliefs regarding that. They weren't afraid because they knew, of course, they had the support of the leaders, but not the first. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders, those who sided with Christ because they knew the leaders had already determined to do away with him, and they also, of course, knew that if they sided with Jesus, the same might happen to them. Now, again, we saw this morning that fear is something that can paralyze us, something that can keep us from doing what it is God calls us to do. But Jesus reminded us that we can't afford to be afraid of the world if we are to follow him. We can't let the world dictate to us what we will do. We can't let fear push us, as it were, into the closet. Jesus says we can't be ashamed of the gospel. If we are ashamed of his gospel, he will be ashamed of us on the day when we stand before him. We can't fear man. We must fear God. We must confess Christ before men if we expect to be, or him, to confess us before the Father on that day. And we must be willing to do this even though it means we will be persecuted. Remember, Paul reminded Timothy, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted because of the two kingdoms. Now this evening what I'd like us to do is focus on what it means to live openly as a Christian, what it means to walk as he walked. Not only because that's what the Lord actually commands us to do, 
Uh, not only because that is what we must do if the kingdom of heaven is to advance, but also because this is the path that we must walk if we are to receive his blessing in the things that we seek to do for his glory. Again, I'm talking here about that virtuous circle. There's only so much you can do at the beginning, but the more you do, the more you yield to him, the more you serve him, the greater will be his blessing and the more you will be blessed in the things that you do. So that's what I would like us to consider this evening, really under three different heads. First of all, that there is blessing in obedience. Secondly, I want us to see what that blessing is. And thirdly, I want us to see what we need to do to gain that blessing or to gain more of that blessing. Now, first of all, I just want to point out that there is blessing in obedience. I don't know why it is that sometimes we think that blessings really only apply to the Old Covenant and not to the New Covenant, or maybe that they're just physical in the Old Covenant and only spiritual in the New Covenant, although tonight I do want to focus on those spiritual blessings that come from obedience. But let's begin with verse 1. The psalmist writes, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He reminds us at the outset that the man who would be blessed by God cannot go in the direction, the same direction that the world is going. But we must live the life that Jesus lived. We must live the life that he calls us to live. Now I just want to point out again, in case we forget, that this is one of the main reasons why God sent his son into the world. He sent him not only that he might redeem a people so that he might glorify his grace, um, so that he might show how gracious he is, how loving and merciful he is. I mean, that certainly is one of the reasons why he did. He didn't send him just that he might save a people to give to his son as his reward. He didn't send him merely that we might be saved from hell, although all these things are true. He didn't come just that we might know him in a personal relationship, though that is true as well. And all those things are very important. But one of the primary reasons he sent his son into the world was that we might become like Jesus. That is what Christian means, after all. And to live openly as a Christian means to live like Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now again, we know that when Jesus comes that we are going to be transformed. Our bodies are going to be conformed to the image of, of his glorified body. We know that's true. But I don't believe that that is only what this passage is talking about. I believe it's talking about becoming like Jesus morally, that is having his desires, particularly his desire to serve the Father and to honor him in everything that, that he does. And that that is not just something that is reserved for heaven, but something that the Lord is seeking to do in our lives even now. That's why he sent Jesus into the world, that we might become like him. He says that we might be holy, that we might become holy as he is holy. In Ephesians 1, 4, Paul writes this, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. And I don't think he's talking just about positionally in Christ, that in Jesus we become perfect, but that that holiness would work itself out in our lives, that we would actually live the kind of life that the Lord calls us to live in other words, he sent Jesus into the world that we might become an obedient people. Before he saved us, let's remember that we were like the rest of the world. We were like those described, um, well, in verse 1, uh, the things that we are to be avoiding. We were nothing more than rebels against God. We were his enemies. We were not walking according to his counsel, but according to the counsel of the wicked. We weren't standing in the path of the righteous, but in the path of the sinners. We were sitting in the seat of the scoffer. Again, Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. 
And even though we may not think this was our condition, this is in fact what our condition was. And by the way, this is the condition of all those who are still outside of Christ, which is why we cannot live the way that they live. Paul writes, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is a commentary on the world in which we live. This is the kind of life we were living, but this is the kind of life Jesus came into the world to change, that we would no longer live this way. God changed all of these things through his Son, so that no longer are we walking, as it were, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is, according to Satan's rule. But now we are to walk and should be, if we are believers, walking according to God's will. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.14 that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. In other words, again, that we would not be walking according to the world, we would not be doing the things that the world does, but rather we would be doing those things that Jesus did. We would be obedient, but we would be servants and not seeking to be lords. So Jesus came into this world so that we might become like him. Uh, this is perhaps the evidence that is most emphasized in the scriptures that shows that that transformation has really taken place in our lives that we really have trusted Jesus Christ, that we really do belong to Him. I mean, we can claim to love Jesus and that we belong to Jesus, but unless we are becoming what it is that Jesus came into the world to make us, it's really a meaningless and useless claim. And we're going to see more about that in a moment. Again, Jesus didn't come for any other reason than to make us like him. Sometimes we reduce Christianity uh, to, well, something much less than what it is. Sometimes we think that Jesus came into the world merely that we might know about him. Uh, that somehow all he desires of us is to learn more about him and his will for our lives. Now we do know that that's what he wants us to do. But Studying theology, studying doctrine, studying ethics is merely a means to the end. It is not the end. Sometimes when we look at all the books that have been written and we look at you know, those people that seem to be highly valued in the Christian church, professors that are serving and teaching in the seminaries, and because we spend so much time studying the Bible, sometimes we think that's really what it means to be a Christian is study the Bible. Study and learn, learn as much as you can. But we need to realize, again, that is that is good, but it's only good if you actually take what you learn and apply it to your life. Jesus also didn't come merely that we might know him. I mean, we need not just know about him, but actually come into a personal relationship with him. That's true that he did, and that's a very important thing. He came for this reason, and he wants us to know him. But he wants us to know him more than just, again, getting, as it were, alone with him in our closets, reading his word and communing with him in that way, he wants us to know him more experientially in the way in which we live. Think about what Paul writes in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him, but what does it mean to know Jesus Christ? It's not just to know about him and it's not just to come into a personal relationship, but it is to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In other words, it's to experience in your own life the same things that Jesus experienced in his. This love of God was not just something that emanated from his heart as he thought about how much he loved his father and that he knew him, but it was a love <clears throat> that moved him to do what his father called him to do 
And in doing that, to experience what we saw this morning, which is the suffering, drawing the ire of the other kingdom and um, having to deal with, with that. He came that we might become like Jesus, that we might experience his life in our life, that we might obey his commandments even as Jesus obeyed his Father's commandments and experience what it is that Jesus experienced. If we live like Jesus, we're going to experience what Jesus experienced. That, I would submit, is his main purpose, at least as far as it has to do with us personally, that he might transform our lives from being rebels and enemies like the rest of the world who are living purely for their own pleasure to begin living now for God's pleasure and finding our pleasure in being his servants and being his friends. Now having said this, let me emphasize what the Lord emphasizes in the psalm this evening, that when the Lord calls us to live this kind of life, when we see that this was his purpose behind everything that he did, that the Lord doesn't just simply command us to a bare obedience and not give us anything in return, although we have to admit that if that's all there was to it, it would still be a great blessing to serve the Lord Jesus, to be like him and to suffer in his place. But the Lord doesn't actually command us to serve him for nothing. He promises blessing, as a matter of fact, in many places in Scripture. But again, in verse 1, of this psalm. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. There is blessing for obedience. Scripture, as I've said, is full of God's promise of blessing for obedience. Let me give you a few examples. Psalm 106, verse 3. How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times. Psalm 112, verse 1, praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 3, which is an entire psalm about the blessings of obedience. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. And then our Lord Jesus in the New Covenant reminding us of precisely the same thing as we saw this morning in the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, verses 3 through 9. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now we understand that Jesus earned heaven for you by his obedience. You are saved by his grace through faith alone, but there is also blessing promised for your obedience if you will obey him. So there is blessing for obedience. Secondly, let's look at what these blessings actually are. The psalmist really gives it to us in sort of a generic or general way, but he does it through an illustration, actually a couple of illustrations. One that is positive, the image of a well-watered tree bearing fruit, and negatively, um, as far as those who won't obey the Lord through the image of chaff. He writes in verses 3 through 6, he, again the one who obeys, who does what verse 1 says, will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So what are the blessings for obedience? The Lord says if you will obey him, he will make you like a fruitful tree. The psalmist uses a picture of, um, actually, you know, it's, it sounds like a rather refreshing picture, doesn't it? You know, here's this idea of a healthy 
and a vibrant tree, one that's securely planted and rooted in the ground, one that is constantly nourished by this plentiful water supply that has healthy foliage and is constantly bearing useful fruit. I think through this image, the Lord is basically saying that if you will obey Him, if you will purpose in your heart to avoid sin on every occasion, and remember, we are faced with decisions continually, whether to do what God calls us to do or whether to do what our flesh wants us to do, what the world wants us to do, what Satan wants us to do, and so forth. We are constantly faced with choices from moment to moment, even as we're sitting here worshiping, as to whether we're going to accept this or not accept this, whether we're going to pay attention to it or not to pay attention to it, when we're praying, whether to pray or not, and again, so many things. But if you will purpose to avoid sin and do what is pleasing to Him, the Lord is saying that you will not only know that you have spiritual life, but He says He will give you an abundance of life. Uh, you will be one who will know that you are firmly rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will have the continual supply of His Holy Spirit, which is what I think the water represents in this analogy. And through that plentiful supply of the Spirit, you will bring forth useful fruit, which is really what the goal of every Christian should be. The fruit of Christ-likeness. The fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of good works that actually advance the kingdom of heaven. He says, basically, the Lord will bless you in everything that you do because what you will be doing is always that which is pleasing to the Lord. Whether you're, you're doing your work, as whatever, you know, whatever your vocation may be, whether you're serving in the home, whether you're serving in particular businesses or whatever you're doing, and particularly as you set your heart to advance the kingdom of heaven by serving those outside and sharing the gospel, the Lord will bless you. He will be with you in the things that you attempt to do for Him. Now let's not mistake what the psalmist is saying here. He's not saying it's going to be easy. As a matter of fact, we know that serving the Lord is like going against the stream. It's not like going along with the world down the stream. That's easy. It's hard to go against the grain, as it were. But it does mean that in the end, the Lord will bless what you do. He will bring good out of what you do. He will bring fruit fruit that will last. By the way, it will also show that you are known by the Lord and that you know Him and that you will stand in the judgment when you see all this good fruit being born in your life. Again, the virtuous circle. The more you serve the Lord, the more you yield to Him, the more He will bless you with the ability to do just that. But the more that you refuse to serve the Lord, the more you choose your own pleasure or the pleasure of your flesh over pleasure that you might find in the Lord, the more you're going to go down and devolve into deeper and deeper sin. Now just think about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father blessed His Son Jesus because He always did those things that were pleasing to Him. If we seek to please Jesus in everything we do, He will bless us in the same way. If we may make our, our food, our meat and drink, to do His will. Now I think that blessing that the Lord promises to us of being like a healthy tree by rivers of streams of water and so forth bearing fruit is better seen when we look at the contrast of those who actually won't do this, of those who, who will not yield to the Lord, who will not obey Him. Basically, that of the chaff in verse 4. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. And I do want you to see that he is characterizing the, the wicked, or he is basically saying that the wicked are those who will not walk in the ways of the Lord, who will not yield to him, who will not obey him. They're like chaff, which is quite the opposite of a well-watered tree bearing fruit. They're like dead straw. They're not rooted in Christ. They don't have the Spirit. They don't have the ability to take in the Spirit just as a chaff, which is, again, dead grass, straw, doesn't have any roots to draw water, as it were, from the streams or out of the ground. So these have no strength. They have no spiritual strength. They have no life. They're dead. And so they bear, of course, no useful fruit. 
And when adversity comes, it blows them away, drives them away. They will not stand in God's judgment. You know, it's interesting that our Lord Jesus uses this same imagery of a fruitful tree in the Sermon on the Mount to describe the differences between believers and unbelievers, between those who are the Lord's and those who are not. And it really has to do with fruit bearing, whether or not they're bearing good fruit or useless fruit. In Matthew 7, verses 17 through 20, Jesus says, So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. I mean, our Lord Jesus is telling us not only that we might know the true prophets from the false prophets by the fruits they bear, and that's something we should pay attention to as we see all the self-proclaimed prophets and Christian gurus, uh, on the radio or on television, particularly television. But it also shows us how we might know what, what we are, whether we're, we're the Lord's or not, by what kind of fruit we're actually bearing. Now, the Lord Jesus doesn't leave it with just this analogy of fruit bearing. He actually spells it out in the following verses, in verses 21 through 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who confesses me or professes me before men, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So what is the difference between the good tree and the bad tree? What is useful fruit? What is useless fruit? Well, useful fruit comes from those who do the will of the Father, who actually submit to His commandments, who walk in the ways of the Lord. Uh, the bad fruit, the useless fruit, are those who practice lawlessness or sin. That is useless fruit, that is bad fruit, and that is the kind of fruit the Lord tells us that we must not bear. We must bear good fruit. That must be the pattern of our lives. So basically Jesus is telling us here it's not enough to say that we are Christians if we're living like the rest of the world. Jesus will disown us on that day if we do. But those who have really trusted him and those who are known by him are characterized, will, will be known by, again, the good fruit, by their obedience. So it's not enough that we just say we're Christians. We must actually obey Him. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who obey Him and those who don't, believers and unbelievers. If you're a believer, you will obey Him. And if, of course, you obey Him, He will bless you and make it easier to obey Him and make you more and more fruitful. Now, finally, let's just consider how to gain this blessing or how to gain more of this blessing. It comes through obedience, but we know there's differing degrees of obedience. And we know that in our lives, we know that from Scripture. So how do we gain, as it were, more obedience? How do we become more submissive to the will of God? Well, it comes, I believe, at least from this particular passage in verse 2, from delighting in His law. Notice, not only do we avoid the paths of the wicked, but he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. With the implication, of course, of applying this law to all of life. So how do we gain this blessing? Well, first of all, we need to understand we're not going to get any of it unless we do the first thing the Lord calls us to do. And that is to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we have to begin. God isn't going to bless you. He's not going to accept anything that you do unless you, f you first come to him through the mediator. And the only mediator he has provided is the Lord Jesus Christ. We do need to understand God will not accept anything we do unless we offer it to him through Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have a mediator. Somebody who stands between God and us 
who reconciles us and who makes what we do acceptable to the Father. We cannot directly offer to God the things that we do and expect Him to receive those things because what we do is always going to be sinful. We have to come through the mediator. And if we haven't come through the mediator, that's where we need to begin. And I, let me just remind you, there's only one. There's only one way we can come to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. Not through, again, other prophets, other religions, other mediators, such as the Roman church provides, as it were, for their people. There is only one, and that is Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 through 6. For there is one God... And one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus is saying exactly the same thing when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you want to gain this blessing, you have to come through Jesus Christ. And the first thing you must do is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus if that is something you haven't done. Otherwise, everything you do in his sight is what Paul said, his good works were in God's sight before he came to know Christ like a big mound of dung. God will not accept it. Secondly, notice you have to have more, that you might say, than just a knowledge of the law of God. You have to be somebody who delights in the law of God, not somebody who just tolerates it and says, well, I'm willing to put up with this if I can enter into heaven. If you're actually going to obey the way the Lord wants you to obey, you have to have this kind of delight. It has to be a desire for the law of God, which is only possible, of course, if you have the Spirit of God in your heart, if you've been called by the Spirit if you've actually trusted Jesus and turned from your sins. That's the only way you're going to have this desire. But realize that if you do have the Spirit of God and you have this desire, I mean some desire, you need to realize there are differing levels of desire, right? In other words, the psalmist here is pronouncing a blessing not upon the person who, again, tolerates the law of God or somebody who likes it a little, or maybe likes it or likes it a lot, but somebody who actually loves it and delights in it. Our Lord Jesus Christ delighted in doing his Father's will. I've already mentioned it was his meat and his drink. His heart's desire was to please the Father more than anything else. That is what you need if you're going to receive this blessing. What is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength. The second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how do you do that? It's by keeping the law of God because that explains to you how to love God and how to love your neighbor. So if you really love God the way that the first and the second greatest commandments call you to, then you must also love that, that explanation of how you do that because that is what you want to do. You need to delight in that law, we might even say, to that same degree. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the degree to which you are to love the law of God. We live in a world in which the evangelical church has really depreciated the law of God. I told you the college I went to basically set it aside entirely and decided they're going to define love the way they want to, but it's not defined as it is in the law of God we need to see that the Ten Commandments is that definition. And that is what we are to love. That's what we are to delight in and to desire and to seek to be conformed to. We must love his law. Even as Jesus said in our meditation, he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. Not one stroke, not one jot or tittle of the law will be done away with. And so whoever keeps and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. But whoever annuls even the least of one of these commandments and teaches others will be called least in the kingdom of God. We do need to be careful about how we treat God's law. We need to take it seriously. We need not only to keep it, we need to love it and to delight in and delight in keeping it because it is good, it is righteous, it is holy, it is what is pleasing to Jesus. It's what pleases the Father. This is what it means to live openly as a Christian. 
Now, having trusted in Jesus, having delighted in the law of God, you must also, of course, meditate on it, which is what you will do if you really delight in it. I mean, if, if we say we love something, our attention goes that direction. We desire it. We want to spend time with it. We want to do whatever it is you can do with that thing that you love because you have this strong desire. Well, what do you do with the law of God? Well, one thing you do is you read it and you meditate on it, not just sometimes, but all the time, day and night. And not just be content with, with just understanding as little as you possibly can about that law, but meditating on it so that you may know what it means beyond what the Pharisees understood. Remember, they were masters at keeping the letter of the law, but they missed the whole spirit of the law, everything that was behind it. You need to meditate on it to understand its broader spiritual meaning. That is what the Lord is really after in these commandments, which of course is loving him and loving your neighbor. And it's more than just the bare letter of the law, it's also the spirit of the law. It also tells you what you should be thinking, what you should be desiring, and you know, it, it commands the opposite of what it forbids. There's just all these different aspects. One example of this is uh, the sixth commandment, which tells us not to murder. It's not enough just to refrain from murdering. If we meditate on this and understand what Jesus is saying, it also tells us that we must not hate our neighbor. It tells us that we must not injure them with, in, in our thoughts or in, in our intentions, our desires, uh, that we shouldn't injure them with our words, but that we should desire their well-being and do what we can to protect their lives and to make them healthier. I don't know if we ever actually thought about that. But um, that's what the Sixth Commandment requires, not just the bare meaning of don't murder your neighbor, but do what you can to help your neighbor, to promote his life and his well-being, and to do that with every part of your being. That's what it means uh, as far as the spiritual meaning of the law, and that's what the Lord wants us to understand. You also, of course, need to let the law of God, as you meditate on it, search these things out in your heart and in your mind to show you whether there are, in fact, things in your life that are violating the commandments because you want to avoid everything that is displeasing to him. David writes in Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Well, how does that take place? How, how does God actually search your heart? Well, you, it happens by praying and asking God to do it and then by reading his word and meditating on his commandments and examining your life by it. So you need to delight in the law of God and you need to meditate on it and finally you need to do these things so that you may apply it, that you may live it, that you may make your decisions based upon it. It's not going to do you any good to know what God requires through all this study and meditation if you don't actually get down to doing it. Uh, Peter reminds us of the warning of those who uh, basically claim to have been cleansed by the blood of Christ and, and uh, being the heirs of heaven, but then who end up falling away because they never really trusted the Lord he, he shows us what it is all their learning will actually amount to uh, in the final analysis and the final day. Second Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, he says, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing uh, in the mire. Uh, Jesus, as I mentioned before, warns us that uh, through the examples of Tyre and Sidon and Capernaum, he says it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment from the, than for those cities because Jesus preached, he taught, and he did miracles in those cities and they rejected him. 
In other words, they had knowledge, but they didn't apply that knowledge. They didn't embrace that knowledge. They didn't do what it is they knew they were supposed to do. Peter here tells us it would be better not to have known the way of righteousness than knowing it to purposely not walk in it, to turn away from it. So we're not studying the Word just to know. If we know and don't do, that's not going to do us any good. We need to live it. We need to apply it. We need to live openly. It's the same thing Jesus warned us against this morning, of being ashamed of the gospel, of not confessing him before men by the way that we speak, by the way that we live. We must go beyond just knowing him or knowing about him and thinking that we know him and again knowing his will, we actually need to apply it. We need to allow his word to guide us in every decision that we make. So basically, the Lord wants you to obey Him. This is one of the main reasons why the Lord saved you, why He sent His Son into the world to obey and die, was that He might give you His Spirit to turn you from rebellion into the paths of righteousness. That obedience is evidence that He has done that work in your hearts, that you really do belong to Him. And if you submit to the Spirit as He leads you according to the law of God, it puts you into a virtuous cycle that will bring God's blessing and will empower you to live an even more useful life to Him. This is the path of blessing. So again, let's not just know what God wants us to do through our studies. Let's make sure that we are, by God's grace and mercy, seeking to apply His Word. Let me close with the words of James, the half-brother of our Lord, the one that encouraged him to go up to the feast because he knew that Jesus would be in danger there, but whose heart was later changed. James is called, um, in many ways, um, sort of like the, um, oh, well, his book is like the book of Proverbs, uh, the New Testament book of Proverbs, because he is very interested in the law of God. Uh, people who don't like the law don't really know what to do with James because James is basically a book about the law of God, but in the context of the gospel, he's talking about evangelical obedience. How is a person blessed? In the new covenant, after they've trusted in Jesus. This is what he says in chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. You know, it strikes me that that final verse is almost mirroring what Psalm 1 is saying. The one who looks intently at the perfect law, that is one who desires it and who meditates on it and he abides by it. He actually lives according to it, not forgetting what he heard, but doing what he has heard. That man will be blessed in what he does. And so let's take this exhortation from the psalmist and from James and from our Lord Jesus Christ, from his example. Let's be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do exactly that.